Good afternoon, everyone. This is the Vermont House Committee on Commerce and Economic Development. Uh, again, it's Wednesday, uh, January 25th at uh, 1.02 in the afternoon. We're here this afternoon to um, continue our discussions on budget adjustment. We're looking at Section 10, the uh, workforce um, language for um, new Americans. And we have with us a number of people to testify this afternoon. I think Adam, um, we have Adam Grinnell from the uh, Brattleboro uh, Development Corporation. Adam, thank you for joining us. Um, I know you've had uh, been immersed in this uh, down your way for the last year or so, and um, I think. Uh, you know, we'd like to hear, you know, what you've been through and um, gives the committee a better understanding of the need for um, to provide this extra funding for uh, for workforce on new Americans. So welcome. Good to see you again. Uh, good to see you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, for the record, my name is Adam Grinold. Uh, I serve as the chair of the statewide workforce development board and I'm the executive director at the Brattleboro Development Credit Corporation. Uh, we are the RDC for the Wyndham region. Um, I have uh, with me uh, Jennifer Stromston, who's the director of programs at the BDCC. So we've prepared um, a brief uh, slide presentation that we can walk through here. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I'll speak at first just to sort of how we got to where we are, and then uh, ask Jennifer, who really leads this work uh, in the region on a, on a daily basis, um, to speak to some of the experiences that we've had and, and what we see coming um, still ahead of us. Okay. I think probably before we get started, uh, Adam, I'll, we have five new committee members this year. I just think it'd be a good idea to have them introduce themselves to you. And I know it's hard for you to see us all on, on your screen. Um, so maybe a um, little voice recognition might help as well. So, Jared? Appreciate that. Thank you. Now, good afternoon. Jared Samus from Castleton. Jonathan Williams, Barry City. Monique Priestley, Bradford, Fairly West, Fairly. Logan Nicole, Ludlow, Mulholly, and Shrewsbury, the ranking member. And Mike Markoff from Coventry and chair of the committee. I'm on Mulvaney Stanek. I represent a part of Burlington. Kirk White, Bethel, Rochester, Stockbridge, and Hancock. Harold Bennington. Heather Chase, Chester, Athens, Crafton, and Wyndham. And I'm Andrew Hegarty, the committee assistant. Great. Well, I appreciate that introduction. Uh, it's nice to see those that I've uh, testified in, in front of before. Um, and again, we're, we're really excited to be here today and give you some of our perspective. Um, could I just clarify, just to make sure for, for timing's sake, where, where you would like us to fit in on this for timing? I'm sorry, Adam, go ahead and say again. Uh, just checking in on the, on the time that you'd like us to keep this to. So we have four presenters, so we, we have an hour to hear from all of you, so we should be in good shape. Okay, great. Um, all right, so uh, I think Jennifer is gonna slide, uh, share her screen. Um, to kick us off on this, if that's, yes, she has the power. Yeah. Uh -oh. Okay, um, great. Well, so uh, again, uh, Jennifer Stromson and myself, Adam Gnold, uh, very happy to be here today. Um, we're, we're very grateful to the legislature and administration for already having invested in the Wyndham Region's efforts um, specifically helping fund some of the work over the past year and a half that we found ourselves um, really in a position to, to, to eagerly do um, and um, probably at a pace that none of us anticipated. Um, the budget adjustment request really recognizes a lot of those funding sources uh, that we have been working under um, and that they're expiring, and yet the work must continue here and across the entire state. Here in, in Southern Vermont, our nascent system is it's just getting started and we have unique rural challenges um, that may find themselves similar to other regions, whereas other regions have different challenges, but we're both new and rural. 
Um, and there's no one task that's been officially, or no one entity that's been officially designated with developing and holding the implementation of the system's development and work. So how did we find ourselves here? Um, and that's what I'm gonna really speak to coming up now is over the last 12 years, we've really been taking intentional steps to get to this point. Um, Jennifer, maybe if you wanna, oh, we're already at this one. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> dating back to uh, 2011, BDCC formed an affiliate entity uh, called the Southeastern Vermont Economic Development Strategies. And that group's uh, purpose was to study some of the challenges fake facing Southeastern uh, Vermont. So uh, this was a grassroots initiative formed by uh, one of my predecessors, Jeff Lewis. Uh, perhaps folks here may, may know him better for his work on the Vermont Futures Project that he did in, in partnership with, with Jennifer Stromston. Uh, in the Vermont State Chamber. Um, Jeff really cut his teeth on those demographic challenges here in Southeastern Vermont and helped us build what became our strategic uh, comprehensive economic development strategy uh, known as the SEDS. And that SEDS for our region um, said that we needed to help keep our region uh, immigration or our population um, from shrinking and we had to keep it younger. So we dove in pretty deeply onto this um, and with that strategic priority, began a lot of work in 2014 and 15 uh, and really were ready to take some steps specific to immigration until some federal changes hit in 2016. So we took a pause, picked that work back up in, in 2020 and that's where we are here today. And through those efforts, uh, we were able to track one of the nine federally recognized uh, relocation entities, ECDC, um, to our region. And they have been relocating folks, again, at a pace far greater than we originally thought. Um, and <clears throat> we were pursuing, during this time, funding under the Boston Fed Working Communities Challenge. We thought we were going to get those funds, ended up that we didn't. Fortunately, our board uh, agreed to fund our work. And with that commitment, um, the Vermont legislature under Governor Scott's recommendation um, and proposal then funded all eight communities under the Working Communities Projects. So we now have long-term funding, um, but we, what we don't, and that funding is specific to very general systems building. We have so many gaps right now that we really need to continue to help pull all those, connect those dots. Um, next slide, Jennifer. So, uh, you know, what are the what are the gaps? Where where do they come from? And this really speaks to this region, the problem here in our region. Um, and BDCC and our partners continue to receive support from the state refugee office. Those supports are very specific. They are going to help uh, a refugee get a job. They're going to help us work with employers to create a welcoming workplace. But they don't necessarily answer the systems development issues. So we never want to get in front of a refugee relocation dollar. Those are those purposes are clear and a very clear priority. But what we found is that we don't have dollars going to that systems development. All the disparate different entities, agencies, departments, nonprofits, volunteers, none of those folks know how to do this dance yet. And we really see the need to continue that here and assume that that need is, is also playing itself out elsewhere in the state. So with that sort of setting of the stage, I'm gonna um, have Jennifer, I think is gonna pick it up from here. Sure, thank you very much. Um, so um, just to sort of like recap, you know, to emphasize one of the things that Adam said, which is, you know, we kind of got to this point by BDCC and SEVED sort of in, in our region kind of in thinking in the future, like thinking long-term and then putting some capacity into that. Um, Eventually, you know, some resources have caught up with that. But in general, the ability to really do anything about that, even if you can envision something new in the future, is really dependent upon the, a kind of capacity that's hard to come by. Um, so we got here, um, we got refugee resettlement into the region in part because we put that capacity at risk. We had a staffer who woke up every single day, tracked people down, responded to phone calls, learned about stuff, 
like just figured this out. And that's why we were sort of ready for this opportunity when it happened. Um, we have, we've done well over the course of the past year um, by sort of making the case and, and getting some support. So Vermont Department of Labor really hurt us when we were saying, we have this great opportunity, but we really don't have the systems together to lean into the arrival of, of these Afghans. Um, and so we were able to secure some time limited resources that um, very, very defined um, and ended by December 31st. And um, that was great. We solved a lot of problems. We built a lot of solutions. We created a lot of um, transitions that are going pretty well. Um, and that's that's wonderful. And we've also had a lot of support um, from the State Refugee Office. Again, a lot of those dollars are really tied to very specific actions, not to sort of bigger long-term problem solving necessarily. Um, the immigration landscape is evolving quickly. And so for instance, you know, five years ago when the borders closed in 2016, Community Asylum Seekers Project was born here. And we've actually been lucky to build on a lot of their knowledge and networks, um, volunteer resources, Part of what's growing here is their capacity. They're um, helping provide volunteer trainings and they provide, provide a lot of knowledge to the Refugee Resettlement Agency, ECDC. When, when ECDC was established um, in 2021, um, that started to bring online you know, the, the development of new capacity and resources. But just this past week, the White House announced the launch of this new Welcome Corps and it's going to change the face of how refugee resettlement happens. I have no idea how. I, was, I spent the morning on the phone um, with someone up here who works in the region on refugee resettlement. I have a staffer right now in a training um, about this, but we don't know exactly what it looks like. Co-sponsors are asking this. And I think it's a great opportunity because co-sponsorship is the way to do really strong community-based uh, refugee resettlement, but it is going to change the way everyone does business. And we need to understand how that impacts us because the vast majority of refugee resettlement is designed around the um, metropolitan areas, areas that have more different resources than even than Burlington. I mean, really, they're mostly designed around cities, places that have bigger institutions, bigger employers, a lot of different entities um, that are specialized in things. And that's not something we have, that's something, you know, Burlington probably barely has, you know, given the scale and also the defunding of them in the past administration. Um, so system building is critical. Um, it's slow going in rural places. We have, you know, turnover and small agencies. We have small employers, um, but we're really good at collaboration. And so building these networks and collaborations, um, it's worth it. It takes time. Um, we're actually really good at it, um, but it is kind of a person by person thing. And someone has to wake up and kind of think that way and not say, you know, wow, this one person's having trouble with their WIOA enrollment but actually say, oh, I better let these other people know because I bet it affects someone else. It has, you have to think collaboratively and get together on a regular basis and say, oh, do we have to change the way we're doing this? Or do we have to create a new process? If we don't have the time to put those pieces together, um, I think we're just gonna drown. I'm gonna be honest, like, because this really does require being smarter. Um, so there's also this, the knowledge building piece, getting back to the fact that I did spend, you know, the first hour of my day it's a long day, so I get the rest of my job done too. Um, but I also, you know, have a staffer who can spend time on this. Frankly, I wish there were five other people in this community who could be paying close attention to what's happening with this co-sponsorship changes um, because it's going to affect us deeply. We're very co-sponsorship reliant. That knowledge building is really important. And we um, try to be a conduit to that regularly. I'll give you an example, just very specific. We're working with World Education Services um, to help with credential validation. Um, and they do put on really good trainings. We were able to send a staffer through working communities to that and also our employment services staffer. But we also facilitated a staffer coming from ECDC from the resettlement office to that because they need to be able to participate in these to be sure that Vermont is using best practices and learning and growing. So, you know, this is kind of how we think about these things. I just wanted to give some examples because when I try to explain to people you know, what, it just sounds so vague, like capacity, you know, um, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to give you like a really, one of my favorite examples of this is this is a long-term ongoing thing. A few years ago, um, I was lucky enough to be able to have a VISTA, this is before COVID times, and um, their main job was to do hiring needs assessments. It was to give us a granular idea here at the very local level of which employers needed which types of workers. So not just like vaguer data projections from the Department of Labor, but like I wanna know the 30 employers that have the most need for certain kinds of jobs. We did one on CDL, commercial drivers. 
And um, so I, you know, I sit on that data. We did, we've done a variety of things advocating for some regulatory, you know, some making it easier for people to get those licenses, things like that. And, but, you know, we sit on that data because we often don't have people to put into, it's great, we know these jobs exist, but the people aren't here. So lo and behold, the Afghanistan situation happens and we find ourselves with a whole lot of people who actually have that exact experience. We have a bunch of people who are in the military for years, a bunch of people who know how to operate heavy equipment, drive trucks, things like that. And they're expressing an interest in pursuing this. And so obviously there's some English language learning in many cases. And so it takes a while. By the middle of last year, you know, through our thinking about this, knowing that there's a need, knowing we have this, we understand who's here and the talents that they have and the skills they have, we start to put that together. And that was just the beginning because then we start to figure out that the Vermont um, CDL process requires you to be a permanent resident. You can't be a refugee. So you know, we're curious about that. And we start to research it. And then we start to hear that Texas and California do allow refugees. So it's not a federal thing. I mean, this is unfolding over the course of weeks. Tracy from the refugee office, Tracy Donald starts to help us unpack this, helps connect us with a legislator, with the department, with, with DMV. And we, we learn that it's actually not a requirement, that the state of Vermont does not require it. That's great. That's great news. We take people on a field trip to the tractor trailer training school. We start to plan for ELL that will help people, English language learning will help people really obtain the necessary language proficiency to successfully do this. We are only, we are nine months into that process. We still don't have this going. We hope that in the next couple of months, we'll finally have with, with SIT World Learning, which has a grant from Tracy's office, have some ELL to help people get into the CDL track and be working it. But we're still working on it, right? And none of the documentation for DMV around CDL licenses actually reflects the change. So there are probably people out there across the state who think that if they don't have a green card, they can't get a CDL license. Meanwhile, we're desperate, right, for truck drivers. So I think that's just one example of something that it just it requires shepherding. And sometimes my shepherding is like literally helping drive people to the tractor trailer school. But oftentimes it's figuring out like when to push a question up to Tracy, when to sort of, you know, figure out how we need to push information out into the refugee community and also, I just want to always put a plug in for this. We are a general economic development agency. In the end, to me, nothing's complete until I figure out how does this make this easier for anybody who wants to do this, right? So how does anyone who wants to enter CDL, are, are there people who, you know, and how does it get funded through WIOA or VSAC or things like that? So that's one example. That's something that's, that will get resolved. And that's going to be awesome when we figure it out. But that is a kind of multiple months thing. Um, Vermont Department of Labor and we owe enrollment is another one. It was not a standard practice. We've spent a lot of time investigating WIO and how it's used in other places. Um, we've really helped, you know, pioneer a practice of enrolling refu refugees um, and new Vermonters in WIOA because those federal funds, you know, to which which are sort of attached to the person are really helpful in resolving anything from like someone needs a bike to get to work or still toed boots to start work or, you know, specialized training that isn't provided on the job, it's, that is an incredible resource for people to sort of walk into sort of, you know, the employment arena with. Um, and so that's a practice that we really co-developed with the, the VDAL office here. And, um, and we continue to coordinate, you know, we are employment services, people who work on the refugee side and our partners are always kind of continuing to adjust and make sure that everyone knows who kind of didn't make it through the thing. They didn't file their selective service thing, or we're discovering that that money can be used for this training at the tech center, but it can't be used for this other thing. And so this is a real process of learning. Um, I have, you know, nine other different kinds of examples. And so I don't want to sort of exhaust you with detail, but um, you know, that's the kind of stuff we spend our time chasing down. And I just like to be really clear. This is something that how we've operated in the past. You know, there's a great example here of a medical assistant training that we helped the, the Memorial, Memorial Hospital and CCV develop. And it was a way for high school students to graduate with a credential and sort of accelerate their um, entry into health careers. And, um, you know, we, we kind of saw that and we heard the gap and we helped bring it together and we helped bring some state funding into that. And then we stepped away. That program goes on without us. No one remembers we had anything to do with it, you know, because when we're successful and we help bring partners together or plug a system gap, gap, gap or help invent a new process, um, you know, that's it. We're out. And I, I see a lot of that happening. I see partners growing into this role. You know, CASP is taking on more and more kind of volunteer training work. 
um, we are seeing a whole big group of the co-sponsors. So those are kind of the volunteer teams that are organized to support refugees. I'm um, going through a really intensive strategic planning process to decide how and where they may want to play a bigger role as sort of a community organization, not just working directly with um, refugees, which is great. And I, you know, I get to be kind of inform that process um, and help them think about where there are gaps they can. So this is rapidly evolving and exciting, um, but you know, we're kind of here kind of shepherding that conversation and trying to look way out ahead. I always joke that like, you know, kind of part of my job is to worry in, in increments of five years. Um, but you know, that's how we get to new places. So, um, so with that, I will just, you know, kind of say, returning back to some basic themes, you know, we, we really need the ability to not just be reactive and in the moment and to be able to respond to new challenges, go seek new resources, um, you know, spend the time trying to find the funding to do the bigger things or do the next thing or do it better, um, you know, building for the future and frankly, you know, making us a model for rural immigration. I, th I think it's, I cannot speak to, I, I can't really capture how beautifully this community has mobilized. And I mean, that includes employers like local sawmill, like yogurt makers, like just, you know, regular retired people, the Rotary Club, like it's incredible. We need to knit that together so it's sustainable. Um, but I mean, I, I'm a believer more than you know, ever that we're going to knock this out of the park. So I just, I want us to, you know, find a way to continue to be rock stars in this. Um, and then I kind of threw in a slide in here, I'm not going to even touch on, but this was just to, to give you, we do direct service. We do help with employment services. And this is some of the data on sort of what we're doing there. Um, but I encourage you to read our, my extremely overly descriptive um, progress reports, the Vermont Department of Labor accounting for the funds that they've invested in this, um, if you want, if you really like detail. So I'll stop there. And if folks have questions for me or for Adam. Yeah, I'm gonna... Emma? Hi, I have, I have actually two questions. So I, as I mentioned, I represent a portion of Burlington. And so I think it was last, I don't know, time has warped the last two years due to COVID, two to three years. And so AALV did a, a tour in the Intervale uh, where refugees and new Americans have been kind of getting access to land and doing um, agriculture and really cultivating not only for their families food, but also ideally, you know, starting to become farmers and getting into our agrarian part of our economy. And I know you're all are, are down in Southern Vermont, but I'm just curious as we think about um, being a rural state and a place for refugee resettlement and also just new Americans in general, if you've had um, some programs or experience getting folks to, to connect to um, agriculture and just that part of our sector, a lot of these folks are coming from agrarian, what I've learned in that, that visit in the Intervale, um, a lot of folks are coming with those skills already and bringing their place-based agricultural um, practices and whatnot. It's just really, it was a fascinating tour. And they talk though about land access, right? And it's great that there was a plot of land that I think it's the Winooski Park District, don't put me on that, where their land is located in the Intervale. Um, but getting access and moving out of Burlington when cost of living is high for housing, but then having access to land is a barrier for folks to be able to kind of really um, set up shop in Middlebury or even more rural in the kingdom or something like that. So I'm just curious if you've had folks express the same interest and if there's any partnerships that are really thinking about the ag side. And then I have a second question as well. Jennifer, do you want to uh, touch on that? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I, I just, I'm lucky to know a little bit about that because um, early, again, again, spending a lot of time in conversations, research, got connected with Pablo Bose at UVM. I think it's his wife who's actually leads that or is part of that um, initiative. And so we've, you know, we're, we're, we just are trying to absorb and learn from folks who have been thinking about this and working this a lot longer than us. And luckily there, you know, there's a bunch of them, Vermont. Um, I can't, I would, I would then pivot to make a more generic kind of economic development response to that, which is, um, you know, again, I, my job is not immigration. My job is the economy and, and workforce, right? And so um, I would say that my goal is that anyone who comes here under any circumstances is able to access any and all of the resources that are available to them, right? So, you know, whether that's, you know, commercial lending to be able to acquire, you know, your farm, or getting plugged into the various networks um, of, you know, agri who that support agricultural endeavors in the state. That that's really it. And I and that's not. I don't say that blithely. Like I I understand that you know it's one thing for people to come here and to be 
treated well and decently. It's another thing for them to truly access resources in the way that anyone who's, you know, a fifth or sixth generation Vermonter might, but that's sort of the standard to which we kind of hold ourselves. And I think that's, um, and so whether it's someone who's trying to obtain a college degree or, you know, buy a piece of land and do something, um, that, that's, that's how we want this to, to function. Um, we don't have yet, and I, this will change, the folks who came in the and for the for the most part who've come so far through the refugee program, um, and I think to some extent, extent through the Asylum Seekers Project, I'm, I don't know all of them. I know you know sort of what a dozen of them are doing um, are not from that kind of a background. That doesn't mean that's not what people's goals are going to be. Um, and then I guess I'll say we're also really lucky that the the Economic Development Director um, for Sevka down here is a, a really big partner for us, the CAP agency. Um, is is involved in that sector is is married to a new american and so we're kind of all trying to make sure that we're you know accountable to whatever sector it is um and and ensuring full access you know to resources for our new neighbors thank you um my second question is uh the classic question of child care because obviously this is an issue that knows no immigration status whatsoever um yeah. it is a reality for workforce and so just wonder if you could speak to that. It seems like I just queued you up with a major softball. So if you could, <laughs> I don't know if it's a softball. It's like, it's, no, it's a huge challenge. It's like, it's a ball of yarn. It's a, totally. it's a mess. Yeah. So um, if you could just speak to that a little bit about just just some, I mean, it's hard enough for folks who, who've been here much longer and are acclimated to just, I always call it the Hunger Games reality of trying to find a spot for childcare here long before you even are thinking about getting pregnant or adopting yeah. or whatever it might be. So I'm just wondering if you could speak to specifics of supporting refugees and asylees and all that and that and help, helping them navigate that where there might be language barriers or just location pieces of anyway if you could just speak to that please totally i'm gonna say i'm gonna say first of all i love when people worry about child care because you know i started talking about child care and, and housing and economic development you know a, a decade ago before it was fashionable to talk about those things in economic development so i really love this that we are pulled all together the second thing i'm going to say is um with you know a, I want to answer your question, but we are not the case management agency. Like we are not the, you know, the refugee resettlement agency. And so they handle the sort of their front line on getting people enrolled in reach up and helping people enroll in schools and the co-sponsors do that. We really come at it from the sort of employment and the workforce and job side. So I will not pretend to understand the level of, um, intense work that that requires for folks to sort that stuff out. Right now, so far, especially because of um, with help, the additional financial assistance that the Afghans have had, a lot of families have avoided this question, is all I'm gonna say. And that's that's gonna change um, in the coming year. So for, for us, where we're coming at this, we have a really phenomenal regional, at least in the Southeastern part, and there's kind of a different one in the Southwestern part, um, child care coalition. Um, and so everyone's, pretty in touch with each other. There, there were early on were some kids from the Afghan community enrolled, um, Winston Prouty and things. So, but I would also, I would go to the multicultural center when it was set up several months ago and they would point next door to the, um, the child care center next door and be like, when can some of the people who are here start to work there? And, and thus began our conversation about how to make that happen. So we, um, with the help of our friends, our, our child care counts group, um, helped us, we were the applicant, apply for some funds from Building Bright Futures to really work intensively on this pathway and try to figure out how to bring more ELL resources. We know this is possible. I think our partners in the North ALV or USCI have done some of this kind of work before, trying to help um, English language learning supported ECE, early childhood education pathways sort of be developed. So we're working on that. Um, with a, we have a kind of a 13 month grant to help pay like for stipends, stipends, pay for ELL teachers, help work with Northern Lights to bring that training in because we want the kind of the solution and the answer to all be kind of bound up together, right? You know, we want to help get people into jobs that are, that are frankly fit with their background and their, their kind of their needs um, as a family and also, you know, kind of beef up our childcare workforce. So that is fun and underway. And um, I hope that in about a month we'll be able to sort of open that up to um, enrollment um, and then we will see what happens. Other questions for Adam or Jen? 
Great. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate your time. Happy to have been here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have uh, the Vermont director of the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants and also a resettlement case manager, uh, Mila. Thank you for joining us, Saeed. Thank you. We appreciate your time uh, with us this afternoon. And you know, we're, we're looking at the budget adjustment um, and we're talking about the $350,000 that's in there to um, assist uh, in employment assistance grants for new Americans and refugees. And um, we just wanted to, I think, hear from you also and to get your um, your thoughts on, on that, uh, that amount of money that we want to, uh, that's being asked for. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting us. It's an honor and a privilege to be here and to um, talk to you about these uh, important issues that we live and breathe and walk um, every single day, day in and day out. Um, I'm Amila Majanovic. Again, I'm the director at USCRI Vermont, the field office of uh, the national, one of national um, uh, voluntary agencies here in Vermont. I've been in this work for 17 years. Uh, my love affair started uh, in 1995. I was resettled as a refugee myself from Bosnia and the rest is history. I've been in this role for almost nine years. So um, I have a little PowerPoint. Oh, how to share the screen. Share screen. If everyone can see that. Yes. Um, I'm joined um, here today by my colleague, Syed Khalilullah Anwari, the resettlement case manager at USCRI. He joined our agency last October and uh, also was a beneficiary of our program. He arrived from Afghanistan in July of um, 2022. In his former life, he was a public servant himself. Um, he worked as a senior advisor for the Office of uh, National Security Council and also was a leader of a political party which had five uh, members elected to the Afghan parliament. He now lives in Burlington with his family. So he will also be addressing you at the end of my presentation. So um, just, as a quick reminder, um, we have been welcoming refugees and, and other newcomers to Vermont for 43 years. We just entered our 43rd anniversary. Our primary resettlement area has been Chittenden County, but we have resettled refugees in Middlebury area, uh, Montpelier, Washington County, uh, and most recently in Rutland County. Our uh, main office is in Colchester, and we have a sub office uh, which um, in Rutland, which has been uh, recognized by the Department of State as a um, viable resettlement site. I want to also uh, spend a minute and remind us all of the vast uh, displacement of populations around the world. The UNHCR, in fact, records the highest number of forcibly displaced people around the world. Uh, that number is 100 million. 100 million people around the world have been forcibly displaced. About 25 million of that are refugees. Last year, if we look at last year, um, we all witnessed the um, fall of Kabul and uh, Afghanistan to the Taliban regime and the massive displacement of Afghans. The United States um, welcomed uh, about 76,000. There's different numbers uh, depending what source you're looking at, uh, but the number is somewhere between 70,000 and 120,000 Afghans from uh, September of uh, 2021 and throughout uh, 2022. The majority of Afghans arrived under humanitarian parole designation, which is a temporary designation 
up to two years. And in the course of the two years, Afghans who arrived under humanitarian parole are required to adjust their status, whether it's um, applying for asylum or if they um, worked with the US government in any capacity in Afghanistan, they can apply for special immigrant visa or SIV. Other Afghans arrived under special immigrant visa designation, which gives them a permanent resident status uh, soon after arrival. And then more recently, Afghans have started coming as refugees and um, through a family unification pipeline. The U.S. government also extended uh, welcome to 100,000 Ukrainians and uh, through the Uniting for Ukraine program. Ukrainians are arriving through the private sponsorship program and um, under humanitarian parole designation. They also um, will be eligible, are eligible to uh, work and access any uh, any other services that um, refugees or other newcomers um, are eligible for. Looking at uh, last year, this is the breakdown of arrivals um, by country of origin. As you can see, the um, highest number is Afghans at 186. 35 Ukrainians and the rest, a much smaller number, um, which breaks my heart on the daily basis is refugees. Refugee resettlement, US refugee uh, program, federal program, um, as Jen mentioned, has suffered uh, uh, tremendous losses. Um, we can, you know, one can make an argument that the program was essentially dismantled by the, by the policies implemented by the previous administration. Although we have a, a you know, friendly administration in the White House that is looking at rebuilding US refugee program, it is, it is uh, very slow. The, the infrastructure has essentially this, been dismantled both overseas and nationally. Um, this is just a quick uh, overview of where we have uh, placed newcomers and the apartments rented by town. And as you can see, we are across uh, seven towns, um, in fact, in uh, Chittenden, Washington, and Rutland counties. USCRI Vermont, um, as I said, has uh, been welcoming newcomers for a long time, over four decades. We provide wraparound services, uh, including reception and placement, reception at the airport, finding temporary and long-term housing, under refugee support services, which is funded by uh, the Office of Refugee Resettlement and administered through the State Refugee Office, we provide employment counseling, job development, English language training, and digital literacy. We also provide a couple different transitional cash assistance programs. We have a contract with the state of Vermont to provide reach up case management, um, I always like to say that the backbone of our operation is community partnership. Uh, through community partnership program, we connect new arrivals with Vermonters, um, family friends, youth mentors, uh, and volunteers. And those relationships become uh, lifelong um, friendships. We have a couple di different youth empowerment and mentoring programs. We provide intensive case management uh, we can't even begin to uh, talk about employment placement um, unless a person is in stable home, they have childcare for their young children, uh, they have addressed their any potential health issues. Um, so all of this is done through intensive case management. We provide health and wellness programming and um, we have a robust interpretation and translation program, which is our uh, social enterprise. The overarching goal of refugee resettlement at the federal level and state level is economic self-sufficiency. Economic self-sufficiency through early employment. 
all refugees age 18 to 64 are required to go to work as quickly as possible after arrival. This is just some data points um, reflecting on the last fiscal year. Uh, through our employment services, we were uh, working with about 98 uh, job seekers and 97 percent of the job seekers were placed in a job and remained in job and are considered self-sufficient. Looking at this data point, um, I think it is incredible for any population, let alone for you know newcomers who don't necessarily have the transferable skills or the uh, English language skills. In the last quarter of uh, a previous fiscal year, we also enrolled 17 Ukrainian humanitarian parolees and uh, their employment authorization documents are uh, pending. And as soon as they receive them, they'll be able to uh, go to work. As you can see, some of the types of jobs uh, where uh, we have placed newcomers include construction, uh, engineering, education, environmental services, food services, healthcare, manufacturing, retail, and social services. The wages range from $14 an hour to 31, and the average is um, around $16 per, per hour for a full-time and 24.80 for a part-time. I will just speak briefly to the uh, Employment Assistance Grant. Um, through this grant, USCRI was able to hire a full-time English language instructor and uh, provide interpretation in the languages that are uh, listed on the slide. Our focus was on implementing English at a work site. This is something uh, that we found through our work with uh, a number of employers, area employers, as a, a great need, critical need. So, we developed a uh, specialized curriculum working very closely with an employer. We um, provide a teacher and any materials. And so far we've implemented classes at uh, UVM, Rhino Foods, Blodgett Ovens, Franklin August and Nolato and are looking to um, implement uh, more in the coming uh, weeks and months. What I forgot to mention, and it's really important, um, uh, speaking uh, specifically about our Afghan uh, new arrivals, two thirds of our caseload are single men who left their families behind and who are responsible uh, and are taking care of their families. The goal, the ultimate goal and the hope is once they're able to obtain either asylum or SIV status, so we are and we're That was coming. <laughs> I'm sorry, my connection is very poor. Were you able to hear? No, we lost you. Where did you lose me? <laughs> Just in the last couple centuries. Yeah, the two thirds, two thirds of the men. Two thirds are single men. They have families back in Afghanistan who they're providing for. The ultimate goal and the hope is to um, get them reunited with their families. So. We are hoping to welcome them in Vermont, um, you know, in the coming months and, and years. And that is the future of Vermont. So I will, um, at this point, I would like to turn things over to my colleague and um, who will talk about, you know, the critical need going forward and, um, you know, some of the uh, important um, supports that we uh, think are necessary for expansion of resettlement and successful resettlement throughout the state. 
Well, thank you, Emila. Honorable uh, senators, thank you for the opportunity and for the time. Uh, let me uh, permit me first and foremost to thank the people of Vermont and also uh, you as their representatives uh, for the uh, gracious welcome that the Afghan community specifically and uh, other new American communities have received. Uh, the support and the welcome has been phenomenal. And uh, me, not only as someone who works as an employee of the USCRI, but also as a beneficiary to the programs by the USCRI and refugee resettlement uh, as a whole, uh, have successfully been able to lead a uh, 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 dignifiable uh, life uh, as I have started uh, the, a new chapter in my life. Uh, uh, there are some uh, regarding the uh, workforce development plan. Uh, there are uh, some successes. Uh, I think the um, uh, level of intrigue and interest that we are witnessing throughout the refugee community, especially the Afghan community, the new American community from uh, or every other state uh, to come to Vermont and uh, start a life here speaks volumes about the, uh, uh, the opportunities that has been created inside Vermont. We are seeing and we are witnessing a steady flow of in migrants to Vermont from many different states um, uh, and uh, people are usually uh, citing two main reasons for that. One being the uh, employment opportunities that are created and present, uh, present within the society. And uh, secondly, the services that are being provided by service providers to the new American communities. Um, um, uh, and uh, most likely, uh, this flow uh, will be greater in the coming year, uh, and uh, especially uh, when uh, we are heading towards summer, I think the in the months of summer, we will be receiving many more in-migrants from other states. Uh, I would like to reiterate that uh, our new Americans, including myself, we have been living a full life before we came to the States. And uh, there is hopes and dreams associated to the, this new chapter of life. Uh, and the second chance that we are getting uh, here at the States, especially in Vermont, uh, despite many of the challenges that exist, uh, could uh, be facilitated uh, to be a very great experience and, and, uh, and fulfilling experience for us, especially if we are able to either continue uh, in the career paths that we were before, or even if we are starting in an entry level job or a, 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 a change in the career paths that we've had, uh, at least it needs to be facilitated in a way that uh, we could uh, move towards self-sufficiency in the earliest possible time frame. Uh, I would like to also uh, plead with the honorable senators that the job placement within the institution that I'm employed at uh, if we were to discontinue this, we would do a massive uh, disservice to the new Americans, uh, just because of the fact that without the facilitation, the language barriers, and also the difference in workplace culture and how work in itself and also 
the culture surrounding it, the environment is perceived in the U.S. and in other parts of the world uh, um, may make it indeed very much harder for the new American community to adapt and integrate in the workplace uh, uh, in Vermont. Uh, intensive English training uh, that are being offered uh, in the USCRI, which are mostly tailored to specific industries and workplaces, uh, has had a huge impact in the ability of our clients to be able to not only get jobs, but also retain them in a manner that could uh, uh, provide them with uh, uh, bread on their tables. And also, uh, some training have uh, redeveloping the technical training curricula that uh, exist uh, within the uh, public domain and also the ones specifically designed by the USCRI has been uh, the ultimate tool for these uh, clients to be able to uh, get jobs, uh, higher paying jobs, and also be able to establish themselves within the workplace uh, and, and get permanent jobs in many cases. Uh, that is why investing in a robust uh, workforce development program for new Americans is uh, really valuable and it will help capitalize on the existing talent in Vermont. Uh, plus, uh, it will help attract talent uh, from uh, all over uh, uh, the uh, United States of America. So uh, the technical skills, soft skills, and targeted uh, workplace English vocabulary, uh, and ideally trainings that are uh, tailored uh, to specific industries, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and the fact that some trainings, if legal restrictions do not hinder people, as uh, Jen mentioned regarding the CDL uh, uh, driving uh, situation, uh, all of these would uh, provide uh, the Ver Vermont and new Vermonters a pathway to self-sufficiency and also uh, dignifiable lives. Thank you, and I would like to go back to my colleague, Amila. Thank yeah. you so much. Um, a couple more slides. One is um, it, it takes a village to do what we do. It always has. I want to acknowledge our many partners. This is just uh, some of them, including um, Association of Africans Living in Vermont, who were mentioned uh, previously, various school districts, um, housing trusts, the cities of Burlington, Montpelier, Rutland, Winooski, and others, um, various health, uh, mental health providers, feeding Chittenden, uh, and actually it's misspelled, um, but it, it's worth mentioning, feeding Chittenden, when Afghans started coming, uh, provided food boxes with um, foods that were familiar to Afghans, uh, including halal meat, to every single Afghan who arrived between uh, November of 21 and um, throughout uh, 2022. One last slide, uh, the future of refugee resettlement um, is, uh, as I mentioned, you know, the Biden administration is, um, you know, committed to resettling 125,000 refugees we have not seen that in the previous year and uh, based on our numbers so far in this fiscal year, it does not look likely uh, that we will reach that number. As Jen mentioned, the State Department launched the Welcome Corps, a private sponsorship model for refugees. So any US citizen or green card holder will be able to apply for uh, to become a private sponsor of 
refugees. So that is going to change refugee resettlement uh, forever. Uh, it's the first year is a pilot. Uh, there's only four uh, national organizations involved with it, but the goal is extended uh, to other organizations. Um, the approved projection for USCRI for arrivals in this fiscal year is 280 refugees in Chittenden County and 45 in Rutland County. This does not include um, Ukrainians who are coming under the private sponsorship and uh, also um, Afghans who are coming as special immigrant visa holders and can travel independently. Thank you again so much. And we will stop here and we welcome your questions. Thank you both. Jim? Um, uh, I wanna speak to the uh, gentleman whose name I don't wanna butcher. I have a question for you. When you were in, in Afghanistan, did you assist the military? I, in my role as the senior advisor to the Office of the National Security Council, I liaised between the, um, uh, as we called it back then, it was Res Resolute Support Mission, which was headed by the U.S. Army. And uh, they provided us with logistical and uh, also some uh, policy uh, support in regards to policy development within the uh, national security sector. Well, in, a, in my hometown of Bennington, we have several new Americans, one of whom is, uh, I live cheek to jowl with, uh, who is a translator. And uh, I thanked him and I wanna thank you for, uh, risking your lives for Americans and for your bravery. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I would like to thank you because uh, in Afghanistan, when uh, any individual were starting to work to, towards democracy and creating that uh, ideal state of being where rights of every individual is respected, uh, there was always the promise by our um, American counterparts and American friends that um, uh, you will have the chance and you will be welcomed back uh, to the States. And uh, it is with great pride that uh, me being today fleeing from the Taliban at the very last minute could actually say that the America and Vermonters have been steadfast in realizing and materializing that promise. Thank you very much. Um, hi, uh, Amil, I wonder if maybe you can answer this question. The question I asked earlier around childcare, yeah. um, I imagine, and I, and I appreciate that piece around two thirds of um, folks uh, coming are single men and their families or may not be here quite yet, but certainly down the road or the other third or so might be having childcare mm -hmm. um, struggles like the like everyone who was here prior to their resettlement um, are having. So I wonder if you could speak to uh, solutions you're finding or needs you're seeing with, with uh, folks that you're working with. Yeah, thank you for that question again. Uh, Yes, it's not a um, surprise that childcare, you know, is a is a challenge uh, for any one of us, uh, especially for you know newcomers who are who are just uh, finding their way around. We have uh, a number of single mothers with young children, and um, I actually am really proud to say that um, our team uh, was able to identify childcare close to their uh, home. And uh, it took a very long time. I will say in one case, it, it, it took a full year um, for everything to fall into place, but uh, we were able to identify a childcare provider and were able to uh, secure an employment for this single mother. And she is starting next week. She has two other children who are elementary school aged, uh, we are working closely um, 
with Child Care Resource, we are very lucky uh, to have a contract with the state of Vermont to provide reach up case management in house. So the reach up case manager works very closely with families with children under 18 on removing any barriers to employment, including childcare. Some families opt for, uh, if there are two parent households, they opt for working opposite shifts so they can take care of their children, um, which really puts a strain, you know, in my long uh, history working in refugee resettlement, uh, with working with my own community, it does put a strain on the family when you have a dad working at night and or a second shift and the mom working in the morning and, you know, they're just, you know, ships passing in the night. But that is the sacrifice that people uh, people make and and to make it work. Uh, one thing we had on uh, one of the slides as uh, challenges is this uh, requirement that the state of Vermont has when it comes to home-based child care centers. The state of Vermont uh, requires a high school diploma. In fact, uh, ALV, in collaboration with Child Care Resource, uh, this was years ago, seven, eight years ago, had... Um, a grant which uh, assisted mainly women in becoming home-based childcare providers. And then that uh, rule changed, I think in the last year of the grant, and many of the women that went through the training program, in fact, couldn't uh, go, couldn't set up the, uh, the uh, childcare center in their home because they didn't have a formal high school diploma. So we we would, you know, I've talked about this in you know many circles. You know, removing that, I, I, removing that would would really enable you know many of our um, newcomers to pursue you know career in childcare. Thank you. You're welcome. Other question, Logan. I was just wondering if you uh, are are these people eligible for the the state child care financial assistance program? The yes. Yep. Yeah. Yes, they are. Uh, they are eligible for any um, any program that any other low income Vermonter would be eligible for. Thank you. Any other questions? a comment uh, thank you for your presentation i just want to commend you on uh, the job that you're doing and getting so many people meaningful work uh right away that list of professions is uh, really remarkable and i'm so glad to see that their skills are being um used um so thank so nicely in positions that are needed here thank you thank you i appreciate it we'll share that with the rest of the team um i uh, there's an employer in north from here i won't name names that has become quite a quite a hot spot um there's about 40 plus newcomers working there great thank you thank you so much for this thank opportunity you. thank you all for joining us this afternoon thank you for all the work that all four of you are doing um extremely important work in in the state um to welcome uh you know, our new Americans or refugees. Um, we certainly appreciate it. If there's anything that you think of that we can do to help um, on the workforce or economic development fields, please feel free to reach out to any of us um, and we'll, we'll try to do whatever we can to assist you. We will do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now we'll switch gears. Um, Sean, good, good afternoon, thank you. Um, I'm Sean Sheehan, I'm a Special Projects Director at the Agency of Human Services. I believe my colleague, uh, Wendy Trafton, is joining. Yeah. Oh, right, right. <laughs> Already there. <laughs> 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 See you there, Wendy. <laughs> I can let you introduce yourself. <laughs> 
Hi, thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is Wendy Trafton. I'm the Deputy Director of Healthcare Reform within the Agency of Human Services. Thank you. Thank you both for joining us this afternoon. We want to go over that uh, section 23, I believe, from the Budget, budget adjustment, adjustment to better understand sure. it. Before we begin, we have five new committee members, and quite frankly, we're not used to having Department of Health in here too often. Um, we certainly welcome you, and, and you know, when we talk about workforce, uh, I think we touch every every agency and department in state government, so we're glad to have you here with us this afternoon. Good afternoon. Jared Sanders from Castle. Great. Good to nice meet you. Hi, Edie Granning, Jericho Underhill. Thank you. Jonathan Williams, Berry City. Monique Priestley, Bradford, Clearly West Bay. Logan Nicole, Ludlow, Mount Holly, and Shrewsbury. I'm the ranking member. And I'm Mike Markoff from Coventry and chair of the committee. Stephanie Jerome from Brandon and vice chair. Thank you. Uh, Kirk White, Bethel, Rochester, Stockwood, Chicago. Jim Carroll, Bennington. Heather Chase, Chester, <coughs> Grafton, Athens, and Wyndham. Thank you. Great. Good to be in person. Emailing, always good to have fun. Have the face to go with the email addresses. <laughs> Terrific. Well, we um, we thought we'd get started. I, I would address the um, questions around subsection two and and four. I believe there's specific uh, questions there under um, and and then Wendy could speak to to uh, section F. Okay. Uh, after that, if that if that works, certainly we could take any other questions or anything else that folks wanted to talk about. The uh, the context here is this is the for the workforce recruitment and retention incentive grant program that that Wendy and I have been um, have been coordinating and administering. This is funds from last year's um, budget adjustment act that were were allocated to provide uh, two thousand dollars initially per full time equivalent in ten different provider groups um, to help shore up the. Uh, the, the, the Vermont's workforce, as I know, as you're saying in this um, in this committee, it's not not just the healthcare workforce, but every angle of the the state is is uh, is, is feeling the the crunch workforce wise. And with these with these funds that came from from three different sources, a small amount from from general fund to larger amounts uh, from from federal from federal grants, um, those requirements we were able to put the the grants out um, had 140 uh, providers that successfully applied, ha had their information together. Everyone who was eligible um, received the grants. We were able to define full-time equivalents uh, broadly, um, giving the providers credit for uh, if they had budgeted positions that were vacant to still get $2,000 for those as well as for the filled positions. Uh, even still even doing that um, with 140 grants representing the uh, vast majority of um, of organizations in those fields doing promotions through the member departments of the Agency of Human Services as well as for the uh, the advocacy um, organizations and, and the trade associations representing each of those 10 providers getting those grants out came to about $33 million of the um, the 60 million fully that was allocated. As instructed, uh, we we came came back for those uh, additional funds first to add additional providers uh, as the language charged for uh, where there was deemed to be um, to be a need. And so those that round will be getting started uh, in the coming week with the opportunity for uh, primary care practices, dental practices, and, and therapeutic community residences to apply, as well as if there were any provider organizations that were eligible for those from those first 10 provider groups that didn't apply for um, for any reason would be able to come, come back in. Even so, looking at that, deemed that there were additional um, funds left and with uh, with BAA was, was where the, these two proposals for the remainder came to, and, and Wendy will will speak to the sort of longer term um, solution side on the nurse building, building the pipeline side. But really, with section two and section um, four, what we were looking at 
was in particularly in looking at the problems and challenges with the uh, with with the hospitals, with with healthcare, the healthcare system in, in Vermont right now, listening to a lot of work groups and being in regular communication with the hospitals and hearing the pressure on the hospitals. A lot of that pressure has come from people who are in hospitals who don't need <clears throat> hospital level care, who, who have subacute needs and are waiting to be transferred out either to nursing homes or to home health uh, situations, other situations there to, to free up those those beds and and the thought here which we heard over that was by, by allocating additional funds so bumping up by by 50 percent two thousand dollar initial application uh, initial allocation to home health um, agencies to have funding to do additional um, retention payments um, was was the rationale behind uh, subsection two there of of changing that total grant award to, to three thousand dollars be easy to administer in the sense that those home health agencies had already applied already submitted all their paperwork um, and get, received the amount of two thousand so, so being able to increase that by fifty percent seemed like a, an efficient way to help uh, shore up that, uh, those pressures on the healthcare system and number four address striking the eligible employers distributing the full amount within 12 months following the, the receipt of the grant funds. Um, that that pertains to, uh, I think when the original language was given, the organization were given from July 1st, the start of this fiscal year, when we started giving out grant, the initial grants went out the end of June last year, they had a year to, to spend those grants or had 90 days from the time they took, they took the funds uh, because from both federal and state rules, uh, you know, financial rules can't be sitting on, on state, state funds. So we gave those initial pool of, of grantees two options. Either they could take the entire grant you know, right away last, last summer and have 90 days to disperse it to their, to their employees, or if they wanted to spread it out over the course of the, the year, uh, they could take it in quarterly batches and give smaller amounts to, um, you know, give give additional retention payments. That was struck uh, here is in the in the funds that will be going out. Um, in by we aim to get them out by the end of end of March um, for the additional provider groups. That their ninety days would take them through you know through the end of end of June, so they would be on that on that one path to making sure the funds are still dispersed by the end of the, the fiscal year. So that's a probably probably could have said that more concisely. That's a long winded explanation of why we why we struck subsection four there of the spending within a year. It'll just be spending within 90 days. Questions? John? It's been a very important program for for our hospitals and our healthcare facilities. I, I'm on the VNA board in Orleans, Essex. How important it's been for us to retain our employees, and uh, we do it quarterly, and uh, very successful for us. Thank you. I, yeah, I appreciate that. We've had the, had the appreciation, We've had the opportunity to work with a lot of the grantees, help them, help them through, and and um, and, and I should mention too that we are having uh, reports. Uh, that, Mid-year reports are coming in now. Most of them they were due last week. Some of them due extensions, but we'll be sharing that information really to be able to show the effectiveness and, and to learn from the, how effective um, these grants were in which ways to work matters. We'll have more information going forward. Any um, organizations that did not participate, or do you feel like you got a hundred percent participation because the money was there to help their employees? Um, we did it. I'm sure we didn't have 100 percent that we we did from working with the the trade associations and the the departments um our estimates are that it was when in that 80 to 90 80 to 85 percent uptake range so because they applied by um by ein number and how the corporate structure was it took a little work to tangle who make sure that everyone did um did apply but it was very large uh, majority of the we heard from some of the smaller ones, I think experiences they had with with other grants and needing some of the paperwork seemed like a you know, heavier lift to do it than they had the capacity um, to to do. We tried to make it the application process as 
as simple as possible while acknowledging that to do due diligence and program integrity dealing with three different funding streams and federal requirements that it's never going to be as simple as everyone um, might like it. Um, so it wasn't 100%, and that's part of the reason we want to make sure when we're reopening the door now for these three new provider groups that we also have that door open to those who didn't apply. That maybe if they were in a position last spring where they didn't apply for whatever reason, maybe the work workload or the burden they had then, or they were, didn't have staff who could have applied or whatever the case may be that they, the door is open um, this winter. It's great that we are, you know, we're able to open it up to other providers. You know, our primary care facilities and um, our dental facilities, they're, they're all important for all our communities. Uh, retaining their, their workforce is extremely important. Uh, it is, thank you. Okay. Other questions for Sean? Should I should I move while Wendy talks? Stay here and okay. <laughs> Wendy, good good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Um, I will speak then to subsection F. So as Sean had mentioned, um, this section is really seeking to ensure appropriated funds will be fully available to meet the high workforce needs of our healthcare providers. Um, we do expect to have a more complete understanding of how much funding will be obligated under both round one and round two of the premium pay for workforce recruitment and retention program by April this year. So that's when we will expect to have received and, um, and awarded the grants to those providers who are eligible. Um, but we do uh, anticipate there could be funds left over at the end of round one and round two. So through discussions with the Healthcare Workforce Development Strategic Plan Advisory Committee and the Healthcare Reform Workgroup subgroup on short-term system stabilization, we've identified some additional needs um, that could benefit from the use of any leftover funds if there are leftover funds. And these would be to expand programs that are, that are currently authorized in Act 183 of 2022. So those two programs, which are referenced in the BAA, focus on nurse preceptors and the nursing pipeline and apprenticeship programs. They're two programs that are going to help us increase the availability of nurses within our workforce. Um, so these programs are both in the final stages of program design and program guidance and applications will be released this quarter. If the BAA request is approved, we would use the remaining funding in one or more of the following ways, depending on the amount of available funds. Uh, the first part is we would expand the nurse preceptor program to additional healthcare employers. This program's initially only available to critical access hospitals. Last week, uh, we submitted the nursing preceptor working group action plan that includes a recommendation to expand this program to hospitals that are not critical access, as well as other non-hospital care healthcare settings, such as mental health agencies and home health agencies. This is one of the uses we are requesting within the BAA. The second one is to use a more flexible funding source. So Sean had mentioned the premium pay program mixes three funding sources, the state fiscal recovery funds, home and community-based services enhanced funding and general funds. So we would wanna use the more flexible funding options to meet the legislative intent of the nursing pipeline and apprenticeship program. So the initial grant program uh, will be providing funding to healthcare employers to enable their existing staff to become higher level nursing professionals by covering tuition and fees. This a uh, scope is more limited in nature to the legislative intent because it uses state fiscal recovery funds, which have a lot of restrictions depending on how the program does or does not fit in within the Treasury rules. Um, so while Act 183, Section 22 also seeks to provide staff furthering their education with assistance in meeting their living costs, such as housing and child care while attending the program, we're not going to be able to do this in the initial rollout of the program because of that restrictive funding source. So if this BAA is approved and funding remains, 
we would be able to roll out a sort of wrap to this program to use the more flexible funding source to provide those living costs for things like housing and childcare for those current healthcare um, employer employees seeking to become higher level nurses. Happy to take any questions. Edie? I have two questions. Um, just first one is basic. Um, preceptor is like a mentor. That can I think about it like that? Yeah, it's a, a current uh, nurse who works for that employer who has the skills to um, work with nursing students as they are um, working to become professionals themselves. They also um, function in a way often working with new employees who also really need that expertise to learn how the um, healthcare employer functions and in that setting or at that organization level. This program is focused on the students, but uh, also in that nursing preceptor working group action plan did recognize there is still a continued need for those uh, new nurses joining the organization for those preceptor supports. So maybe more than a mentor, maybe more training, or is it really just mentoring? Like that's, I'm just trying to get my brain. I, I think the analogy of a mentor is, is good. I think there's a, a a specialized skill set and, and requirements around it, but it is essentially a, a mentorship role with specialized expertise. Okay, and then just, I'm imagining that the less skill, I mean, all nursing positions are, we need more of them, right? But I'm imagining that the less skilled, there's, there's a bigger gap in what we need in the higher skilled programming, which is why you're looking at taking the the, easy, the licensed nurses at the lower levels and giving them the, the extra training to be the more skilled nurses. Is that yeah, ideally, ideally we have career ladders and pipelines so people can come in, work, continue to gain the skills and, and, and become those higher level nurses and we can maintain that, that career ladder over time. I just, I don't wanna set up a system where we're now gonna have a bigger um, gap in the lower level nursing program because we're doing this. And so I'm just trying to think about this on a, on a larger scale. Obviously this is a pilot type thing, not a lot of money, but I'm just, I just wanted to make sure that the need is there in the, in the obviously everybody should have a great career path. That's ideal, but I just wanna make sure the need is there. Yeah, and I could add an item. But, but, um, I think particularly a lot of you know, I think the, the hospitals, health healthcare facilities, even the, the state um, facilities, the Vermont Veterans Home, the Department of Mental Health facilities, with the shortage of those higher um, higher trained nurses and higher level nurses, uh, end up spending you know millions on on traveler uh, traveler association and a, a traveler agency nurses and. Um, and I think that's that's a piece of having that career pipeline um, that's in, have in place out. would 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 help address that. I think the you're certainly right with at the lower level, um, just like in every sector of um, you know the state, lower level jobs, other level jobs, we need more workers. Period. And I think that's that's a piece that can be addressed through other channels. But I think for people to come into that nursing pipeline, as as Wendy. Uh, referenced and have that career ladder option might both entice more people to come in and take a job as a licensed nursing assistant that may not pay a lot more than, than say, you know, working at a, a restaurant or some other options that people with similar um, lack of, of uh, specialized training could have, but having that window and that career ladder could be a hook to, to come in. Um. Who made the determination that ARPA dollars would not be able to cover the living costs for the nursing pipeline or the apprenticeship program? I was under the impression that uh, per final rule, U.S. Treasury Department final rule guidance that almost any healthcare cost is an eligible use of ARPA dollars. Is that incorrect? Um, you, you speak to that? Do you want me to address I that one? That. 
So um, the internal process is for each of these programs, we work directly with the agency of administration and their contractor to determine what components of this program um, have risk or do not have risk to the state. Um, and so in looking at this, uh, this program and this section of Act 183, it was determined that you would, in order to do the full set of activities, it would need to be substantially means tested. Um, the alternative is to do it this way in which the program is um, able to meet the broader set of healthcare employer staff, but does not fulfill the full scope of the activities that we would like to support. And so there was a choice that had to be made. And in terms of being able to, to administer this program and make it effective for those employers, um, we had to choose to use the funding in this manner. So oh, that's it was, was Guidehouse working with ALA. Is that the yeah. House is the firm with the LA, right? And so we are able, if in this case, this is where we're thinking of the wrap components, is there are general funds available in our remaining dollars from the premium pay program. So those would allow that flexibility to wrap the program. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. And the Act 183, the $400,000 for the for the $50, the $5 per hour preceptor hour piece, was that was that all? Uh, so I'll give it out. Um, that, that program, as well as the pipeline uh, program that I mentioned, are both going to be rolling out this quarter. Uh, so we don't yet know how much the funding's going to be utilized under the current scope, but we do know that there have been um, demands on the program that just cannot be met with in the current scope. So um, this one's only available to critical access hospitals. There's other healthcare employers that utilize nurse preceptors that are really um, hoping to bring in those Vermont nursing students and um, help them continue in their roles at those organizations. So I wonder, I mean, just reading this, so we had allocated the 400,000 and and the way this now reads, any remaining funds following a second round of funding may be used for one or more of the following purposes, that includes that piece. Does that mean your intention is to take that 400,000, roll it into the other part of the program, and then if there's any left over, give it to the preceptors? Is that the, the thinking here? Right. It's, a, it's a little complex in terms of the best way to administer the funds, but we don't want to be holding on to these dollars any longer. There's such high need for these, uh, this programming that what our intent is to roll out the program with the state fiscal recovery funds now in alignment with the Act 183 um, language. We would... Um, be issuing grant awards if this funding then becomes available for those programs that it's expanding to new employer types, we would be um, starting a new application process with those employer types and issuing grant awards using the, the applicable funding source. Um, for the other one, we would be hoping to collect as much information as possible through the initial application and then would need to issue an additional grant award using the additional funding source to expand um, the scope of the program to allow them to meet those living costs. Those are the two different approaches we would need to use, um, just giving the timing and, and wanting to be able to get these out as quickly as we can. If I could ask, if I understood right, the, your, your question, though, were you asking that, that $400,000 isn't being rolled back into the other pot and the risk yeah. of not being given out to the nurse preceptor. If you're asking that, that yeah. it hasn't been given out yet. It's being given out yeah, as part of the program is rolling out. It will be, it yeah. will be given out. Additional funds from this other allocation. Will then augment it. Possibly going. Correct. So 
do you anticipate that that 400,000 will be fully expended when you roll out this first iteration? Um, I, I'm not sure we know yet. There are eight eligible organizations since it's restricted to critical access hospitals. Um, we do see a potential for it being expended. Again, another challenge with the state fiscal recovery funds is the rule uh, restricts this to um, it being premium pay for work performed during the public health emergency. So we don't have the ability to sort of run this program indefinitely to use the full $400,000. I think our hope is that we'd be able to use these funding quickly enough with the critical access hospitals to um, allow them to use those funds during the public health emergency. And I'll just ask, what is what has been the delay in standing this program up? Because we, I mean, we passed it last July. It has been a challenge in terms of understanding the allowable uses of the funds. And then um, we've hired a contractor to enable us to work on program design and implementation. Um, so there's just been uh, more hurdles to being able to implement, which are uh, fairly challenging federal requirements related to this funding source. That's a challenge when you go out and hire a contract with the RFP process and all of that. Yeah, it's yeah. not a fun process either. Do you, um, so I see in the new language that you're proposing, your, I mean, currently we, you're saying that we somewhat hamstrung you by limiting it to critical access hospitals, but with this new language, it is for only for nursing students enrolled in Vermont nursing schools. Do preceptors not work in non-nursing schools? Um, so I think what it's limited to, I'm sorry, I'm trying to, to track the question. So it's limited, the current language, which we carried forward to really maintain the, the current scope of the program with the exception of which employers are eligible. Um, so that was really focused on Vermont nursing schools and those students in Vermont nursing schools. So we didn't seek too broad in that language here. Yeah, just you wanted to remove the critical access hospitals piece. Yes. But still keep it within the verb. So I guess I'm, I'm wondering if there is there a need for this in those other in hospitals that are non nursing schools? Um, so it isn't for um, hospitals in nursing schools, if I, I may be misunderstanding your question, but it would be for hospitals who are have staff who are acting as preceptors to students who are enrolled in Vermont nursing schools. Oh, so the yeah. relationship between the nurse and, and the Vermont nursing, the employer and the Vermont nursing school is, is what's matters. Yeah, I misread. Yeah, fair enough. Thank you. Would it, would it make sense to add language on the 400,000 that if it's not expended by a date certain that you could open it up to that 400, the rest of the remaining amount of 400,000 to what what you're intending to do here, uh, the, you know, the, the hospitals that are critical access, the VNAs, mental health, wherever, um, so that uh, we're not holding on to that 400,000 and we get it expended. Does that makes sense. I think that would also be a helpful approach. Is there, if you could think about it a little bit and, and give us an idea of, you know, how long you you should go before we, you know, we would allow for that opening up to the. Yeah, and yeah, we can we can follow up on that and circle back to the committee. That way, we don't have to worry about you know having to come back because you couldn't fully expend it, and then. Um, say yeah, you can now lump that in with the with 
you know, the new program that you want to do, which is the same program except with with, with everybody else in it. Yeah, just revert it to the other part of money. Right. Yeah. I think I think our you know what we want to see is which I think is the same as what you'd like to see is more nursing students get into you know the clinical settings as quick as possible to get them through to get them in the field as soon as possible. Right, that's the goal. Heather, um, the definition of preceptor is also um, bringing on uh, onboarding a new uh, or a nurse that's been out of the field who's coming in again so that's included in this too right or is it just students i'm trying to that is that is not currently included in the language um again we we thought to increase the we thought to change the funding source to meet the legislative intent but we did not seek to um Brought in the program, so that so that would be another expansion of the program in alignment with some of the recommendations that that were submitted last week by that action group, by that that working group. What was the original intent when you did the four hundred thousand last year? Was it just for students? Yes. We hadn't heard any, you know, from anyone on. Well, when you're a preceptor, my understanding in a hospital, you're orienting new staff members who may be students, but may be an old nurse, I'm thinking of myself, who says, okay, I want to go into clinical nursing. And they go, okay, well, we're going to give you a month's training where you're shadowed, right? And so I just thought that that would be, we're trying to get people in to help this crisis. So I didn't understand that part. Okay. It was a confused, it is confusing in that as we were working on this, we discovered the two definitions to preceptors, but we were looking at new, trying to educate new students, bringing more nurses online, more nurses educated in Vermont to, to get more training in the hospitals that they need as part of their education. So that's what that, this was focused on. That's the nurses who are students now. But I totally understand what you're saying because there is another role of training well, and experienced nurses into new roles. And if right? you don't do if, hires, if it's late in getting going, right, and you don't think you're going to use the money, why wouldn't you expand? That's just my thought. But I do think you will use the money. It's unfortunate it's taken a long time, a long time to get this up, get this up and going. I, um, I, we had the number of hours that this was going to help, and I, off the top of my head, I don't know, Kirk, if you remember that, like how many students this was going to help or how many no, hours. Like um, but, um, oh, I guess I could divide that, right? Five yeah. to 400,000, I could figure it out. But but it was going to be a sizable, or it's sufficient, probably not good enough, but a sufficient amount of money to help uh, incentivize experienced nurses to <coughs> more students the more responsibility yeah okay but the more you know i you know and i'm i'm sure you know this but you know the funnel that we were looking at you know we got a wide open funnel here and so we had issues with um uh, teaching nurses so nurses that are coming in to teach in the in the colleges so we that that was a restriction and then as we're those those you know nurses that have gone through the program now need to go to the clinical setting to learn that there was a further restriction so the more that we can continue to open that funnel up and get more people through that through that funnel quicker um you know is beneficial to all of our health care so um we're, i think that's what we're working on is you know, getting the people in the funnel, but making sure that the people that are teaching them, uh, uh, we've got to, you know, we need to grow that that field as well. And then we also need to grow the field of, of pre preceptors uh, in the clinical field to, to get to complete their, their uh, education. 
Anything else? Everybody pretty clear now on what we've heard from the hospitals and the VNAs and we've heard from the department now and we better understand uh, what this all does. But. I do have one, one question. It's semi unrelated, but uh, in uh, Act 183, what became Act 183, S11 for us, uh, we had asked for a report on uh, EMS from the Department of Health. I was just curious if it was supposed to be any update on timing for that. Follow up on that with, with the Department of, of Health. And yeah, no, yeah. Somewhat unrelated, but just while you're in the room, we don't get AHS in here a lot. Right. <laughs> well, I'm happy. I'm happy to follow up on that. Thanks. <laughs> <Right. laughs> okay, I think we're good. Um, if you could get me that as soon as possible, so we can work it into the language, uh, that would be great. Thank you. Both. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Appreciate your time. back here after the floor. Um, Jen will be joining us. Jen is here with us now, but um, she'll join us after the floor. And I don't think we have a lot of work to do unless Jen has spotted something in the language of the, the healthcare piece. We, we were just chatting with them and I think we understand what's going on now, but the 400,000 that's there now for the preceptor program that they're trying they're getting ready to stand up um, is only for critical access and they now in the, in the new iteration they with new dollars they want to include non-critical care hospitals and DNAs and everything. I think what we'd like though is is some language that would allow if that 400,000 isn't expended by a date certain that it would allow for them to um, utilize those other um, non-critical access hospitals and all the ones that they're talking about in the new program so that you know we're not holding up that money from from being utilized and having to come back again and try to reappropriate it okay. um, they're gonna they're gonna come back with a with a date certain you know if it's 90 days or you know 120 day whatever they come up with but then we can insert that into the language as well so then Jen is gonna help us also start formulating our letter. So we'll have some of those discussions. My my goal is to try to get us out of here, you know, by four or four fifteen so that anybody that's traveling can get on the road before things get really dicey. And then if you know, whatever do we know if David is gonna be able to join us tomorrow? I don't. So um I should be able to. You'll be able to. We've got this scheduled again at nine. Yep. Um, so we'll see where we go, and um, you know, what if we need more time to finish the letter up tomorrow? We'll move things around in the agenda. But this is going to be our priority to get this out, um, get the letter done tomorrow. Okay. Let's um, take a fifteen-minute break before this.